Hi, we are here for the next installment of the COVID-19 series. Uh, and uh, tonight uh, we are dealing with something very important, and that is the cardiovascular complication of COVID-19, and in particular, myocarditis. I know that it is in the mind of most of you. The question, is there a viral myocarditis complicating this uh, syndrome? And tonight here, uh, we have as our expert, Professor Alida Caforio, who is the chair of the myocarditis and the uh, cardiomyopathy registry of the European Society of Cardiology. Alida, thank you very much for joining us tonight uh, and finding time uh, to inform us on, on this particular issue uh, for which you have spent a, a lot of time and a lot of your career. So, is there such a thing as a COVID-19 myocarditis? Uh, thank you, Barbara. Good evening um, to all colleagues. We'll try to, um, to understand what is known and what is unknown about this important issue. As a matter of fact, now we have more than 300,000 subjects who have developed COVID-19, which is uh, mainly a pneumonia, which may be complicated in a minority of uh, cases by uh, severe um, hypoxia needing a need uh, for ICU mechanical ventilation with possible complication up to ARD and uh, in a few cases need uh, of ECMO. However, uh, arrhythmia is not a common feature of COVID-19. Now, negative predictors of death in COVID-19 include uh, older age, in Italy the cutoff is about 70 years old, and uh, cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular uh, comorbidities, for instance, previous uh, coronary artery disease, uh, as well as cardiac injury, uh, defined uh, by increased troponin and natriuretic peptides. However, these, uh, these epidemiological features um, do not uh, actually fit well with uh, the epidemiology of biopsy proven myocarditis because this is uh, the, a common disease in the young and in children may occur in middle age but is rare the elder, in the elderly and is uh, dominated by heart failure, arrhythmia, with or without troponin release. Actually, there are many forms of biopsy proven myocarditis without troponin release. Um, uh, so far in the literature, uh, we have three case reports of COVID-19 associated myocarditis. However, these are clinically suspected cases, not biopsy proven. And uh, one case report at autopsy actually found no myocarditis on heart tissue. And uh, uh, so the, um, let's say the issue, the hypothesis came from uh, uh, the observations mainly in the Chinese populations uh, that uh, in about 7% of patients there is uh, such acute cardiac injury and uh, people uh, um, uh, thought that this might relate to uh, myocarditis. However, as you can see in uh, this um, uh, very nice, important uh, um, observation just published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine, this is a case, uh, in a pathologically confirmed case of a victim of ARDS in COVID-19 disease, and um, there were no evident uh, heart, uh, the evident uh, histological changes in uh, heart tissue, suggesting that actually uh, this infection does not impair directly the heart. So that's what we have. These are the facts, actually. I see. So maybe it's uh, a good idea then to rehearse uh, uh, what is a myocarditis and what do we need to make a diagnosis of myocarditis? Well, um, Barbara, yes, uh, that's very uh, important. That's very important to remind uh, what are the diagnostic ESC diagnostic criteria for myocarditis. Myocarditis is a, a difficult diagnosis. And uh, first of all, you need, of course, a plausible clinical presentation uh, that may be with a pseudo infarct presentation, uh, acute, subacute, chronic, or fulminant uh, heart failure, uh, or uh, an arrhythmia 
scenario that may be mild, may be life-threatening up to sudden cardiac death. However, you need also, in association to that, uh, fulfillment of diagnostic criteria from different categories. ECG with the newly abnormal uh, changes, uh, presence of uh, increased troponin, if, uh, if it is present, of course, functional and structural abnormalities on cardiac imaging that may be new, otherwise unexplained, and, and maybe segmental or global, and a tissue characterization by CMR with the edema and leg gadolinium announcement on tissue characterization. Uh, however, having said that uh, clinically suspected myocarditis means presence of one or more of the clinical presentations and one or more of the diagnostic criteria from different categories, then uh, it, it is still a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to exclude uh, other causes that might, um, might explain this scenario. First of all, of course, coronary artery disease and acute coronary syndrome, but also other causes such as uh, pulmonary embolism, for instance, that might be the two release or um, no specific release of troponin. And uh, that's why, in the end, the diagnosis of certainty of myocarditis is based on uh, endomyocardial biopsy uh, and or on autopsy, but fortunately we have endomyocardial biopsy, uh, using not only uh, histology to say that there is uh, an infiltration of uh, lympho lymphocytes and macrophages um, or eosinophil or other cellular uh, inflammatory types. And we can, uh, it, in, it is important also to use molecular methods, PCR-based methods mainly, to, um, uh, to identify a genome of the viral, uh, viral uh, poss possible viral uh, agents. Uh, that's the only way uh, to say that we have viral myocarditis due to, uh, for instance, uh, enterovirus. So far, we don't have such evidence for COVID. The 19 myocarditis. I see. So, I mean, what it is then that it might uh, cause the increase in troponin in these patients? I mean, uh, aspects that, you know, I've heard uh, as a hypothetical mechanism that you may have uh, a cytokine storm. So, in that case, you may not have a direct effect of the virus in the heart, but an indirect effect. So what do you think about that? Uh, well, Barbara, it's quite uh, quite correct. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, there are several um, potential mechanisms uh, to explain troponin elevation in COVID-19 patients. Uh, in general, uh, acute respiratory infections, even uh, you know, uh, community-based uh, uh, pneumonia, uh, can uh, give rise to troponin, and uh, the rise it correlates with disease severity. First of all, especially in using high sensitivity um, tests, such as with the, the ones that we use, but also uh, type one um, MI due to plaque rupture, uh, which may be triggered by infection, or type two MI. Uh, based, of course, on the disequilibrium of uh, supply and demand in an in a, an hypoxic situation is quite a plausible uh, um, possibility. Uh, but either way, I mean, uh, abnormal troponin does not it is not equivalent to myocarditis, and it is not equivalent to acute MI. For instance, for acute MI, of course, we know that we need the clinical signs and symptoms, ECG changes, and for, and for myocarditis, we have myocarditis that is not, um, does not lead to troponin release. So. Okay, no, no, that's uh, quite... And, uh, so, as a matter of fact, in this nice uh, cartoon, um, uh, recently published cartoon, uh, there have been several mechanisms uh, but uh, these are just putative, actually, and uh, uh, none of these have been uh, proven. Uh, the uh, main mechanism uh, that has been uh, put forward uh, to postulate a possible viral myocarditis due to COVID is uh, that uh, the virus uh, could uh, um, could uh, bind to ACE2. Uh, ACE2 is uh, widely distributed uh, on uh, on the heart. So the hypothesis is that uh, the virus binds to ACE2 and then uh, and, and this uh, uh, gets into the cardiomyocytes and leads 
to cardiac uh, necrosis, to viral myocarditis, is an interesting mechanism, but not yet proven. And then uh, we are all confident about the hypoxia uh, induced myocardial injury, of course, possible microvascular damage, um, even uh, an increase in prothrombotic oh. mechanisms induced by the infection leading to ischemia. And finally, last but not least, the systemic inflammatory response and the cytokine storm uh, that, however, uh, is uh, uh, looks uh, plausible in the uh, second and the last phase of the disease um, in a, on a minority of patients, and it is quite frightening, of course, because it is usually associated uh, with ARDS and with multi-organ failure. I see. So it's uh, all uh, uh, in the air, really, uh, at the moment. So in the midst of this, how should we treat these patients? I mean, do you, in your center, give steroids? Well, Barbara, this is uh, really a huge uh, question. Um, and uh, uh, as a matter of, of, um, of fact, um, uh, we use uh, steroids, uh, but mainly in combination with the other immunosuppressants, only in uh, biopsy-proven, virus-negative, non-COVID-19 patients. And this is in keeping with the DSC recommendations set, uh, set up in uh, 2013. Uh, so um, uh, in the last month, uh, from the onset of COVID-19 epidemic uh, in Italy, and uh, Veneto, unfortunately, was uh, one, uh, and Padova was one of the first red zones, we had uh, three patients, uh, where we admitted three patients with a fulminant myocarditis in uh, young people, and uh, uh, all of them needed an uh, ECMO support. However, um, they were all biopsy proven, none was COVID-19 associated. Um, that's uh, our experience at the moment. So uh, we don't use steroids uh, in clinically suspected myocarditis. Thank you very much. And, and uh, what about other treatment? I mean, I, what is your experience? I mean, do you uh, use any other uh, uh, antivirals or antibiotics or anything in these patients? Well, Barbara, thank you for this. Uh, this is the really, uh, you know, uh, um, most important question. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, all us as uh, all colleagues dealing with this uh, terrible disease are actually sailing in uh, uncharted seas. And uh, most uh, um, experts, uh, COVID experts, um, uh, think this disease uh, go uh, through stages. And the first stage and the second stage are actually uh, related to the viral response. And uh, the first stage uh, is uh, associated with mild constitutional symptoms, flu-like symptoms. The second uh, stage uh, is, the, uh, is the onset uh, of pneumonia. Uh, most um, colleagues um, caring for COVID uh, believe that in this uh, phase, steroid are contraindicated because it may actually reduce uh, the clearance of the virus and facilitate actually the infection. Um, whereas uh, in the last stage, that fortunately um, applies to only a minority of patients, there is a hyperinflammation phase uh, and cytokine storm. Um, and uh, possibly um, in, this, in this stage, one could foresee the usage of uh, um, especially um, anti-cytokine, uh, cytokine inhibitors, IL-6, IL-2, or even JAK inhibitors uh, to treat. But uh, is uh, still uh, there are no controlled uh, control data, and uh, it was quite uh, uh, quite important, quite useful that uh, in, in these days the guidelines uh, uh, of European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Uh, where uh, um, came uh, came out uh, on uh, the treatment of uh, critically ill uh, adult patients with COVID, and um, all such um, uh, treatments from steroids, uh, with or without 
without in patients with or without ARDS uh, or IVIG, uh, interferon, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. They were all, they had all weak recommendation, low quality evidence. Uh, although in general, as for the WHO, uh, there was a tendency to say that the steroids are maybe uh, is controversial, the use of steroids, and maybe even detrimental, especially uh, in, uh, in the early stages or uh, in uh, most patients. Uh, um, as far as uh, the cytokine storm is concerned, um, uh, this is a highly cited editorial that was published in The Lancet recently, pointing out that uh, for, uh, for just for the patients with uh, a secondary hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis syndrome, that is a very uh, hyperinflammatory syndrome um, characterized by uh, an, uh, hypercytokinemia and multi-organ failure, and there is a score that one can use to identify such patients um, uh, where this syndrome is usually maybe triggered by viral infection, so might be present in COVID, uh, severe COVID patients. Then in these cases, one uh, should foresee the use of immunomodulatory anti and anti-cytokine therapies. And uh, uh, although, once again, in the guidelines, uh, they say that there's still insufficient evidence to issue a recommendation on the use of this uh, tocilizumab uh, in uh, these patients. Uh, I must say that uh, in Italy, uh, starting from the uh, Naples observations, um, also in several centers and also in, uh, in Padova, uh, there is uh, an experimentation of this drug in, uh, in COVID, and we all hope that uh, this might be uh, helpful for uh, our patients. Indeed, in very severe patients also, we never consider that these drugs for which there is little evidence of benefit may actually cause harm. And that is another point that uh, needs to be taken into consideration. But uh, in any case, um, we're ready for your take home message. Yeah, this is uh, very important what you say, Barbara. In particular, even for tocilizumab, there was uh, there were some warnings, and so um, as I say, I mean uh, we have a take a take home message that is uh, an interim message. Is uh, let's say uh, what we can say between knowledge and ignorance, and. Uh, uh, we don't know a lot of things about this new virus. Um, however, uh, what we can say uh, now is that uh, myocarditis is not a proven complication of, of COVID-19 at the moment because the diagnosis of myocarditis and of its cause is based on endomyocardial biopsy and we do not have so far such data in the literature. Uh, we know for common experience that abnormal troponin level does not equate to myocarditis or myocardial infarction, particularly in a very, um, in a very uh, dreadful and severe um, septic uh, situation. Uh, and uh, we have unfortunately no evidence-based treatment apart from supportive treatment, uh, oxygenation uh, for COVID-19 complications. And therefore, we really need um, randomized controlled trials, even in these difficult situations. Uh, and uh, as well as we need the basic uh, and translational research on, uh, on the virus itself its mechanisms of pathogenesis, especially to the cardiovascular system. No, indeed. No, thank you very much. I think there is a lot of research uh, on COVID-19 at the moment uh, at all of these stages, basic translational and several ongoing clinical trials, uh, which we, will, we hope we will update on. So thank you very much, Alida, for contributing uh, this, your knowledge with us uh, and helping, hopefully, all of us. Uh, to deal with this emergency in a more informed uh, and, uh, you know, in a better way for, for our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara, and good luck to all colleagues in this. And to you. Stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye.